Hey folks, I am in the midst of a series of episodes where I am developing a project with the goal of creating a visualization that shows across the globe the level of droughtiness for say the past month relative to uh, that same window of the calendar for the past say 100 years. To do this, I'm downloading data from the NOAA website. NOAA is a US-based agency, but they collect data for weather stations uh, around the world that has different types of climate data. The challenge that we have run into is that my end goal is to post this code and all the compute up to GitHub as part of a GitHub Actions procedure. So GitHub Actions will limit the amount of drive space that we use to about 14 gigabytes. So the composite data set that I'm downloading from NOAA compressed is 3.3 gigabytes. Decompressed and extracted is about 29 gigabytes. So that's well over the size of the footprint that GitHub Actions will allow. What are the alternatives to extracting the entire archive and working with individual files? Well, thankfully there is a handy dandy R package called Archive that will allow us to extract individual files from that compressed archive, work on that, and then get the next one. Work on that, get the next one, right? And so we can leave this archive, which we call a tarball, uh, as it is compressed and extract individual files to then create a composite data frame. So that's exactly what I'm gonna show you how to do in today's episode. We'll kind of uh, see how we can create archives as well as extract archives and then apply it to our actual use case to see if it's going to help us in the long run with what we want to do. So here in Visual Studio Code, I have a practice R script opened up that I will be using for demoing some of the utilities within the archive package. I'm also in my terminal here in the project root directory drought index. Main is red because I've created this practice R script and it's not being tracked. If you would like to get a copy of my project as it currently stands with all the code and everything else, uh, you can go down below in the description. There'll be a link to a blog post that will help you to get a copy of the repository as it currently stands. If I look in my data directory, I see I have these various files that we downloaded from the NOAA website. Within GHCND all is, uh, let's see, a, a variety of files that I extracted from the tar archive. Again, we call that a tarball. I see I have three files that I'd previously extracted from GHCND all.tar.gz. So that file that ends in tar.gz is a compressed archive. A GZ file, if you see GZ at the end, that means it's been compressed with the GZIP algorithm. It's kind of like zip or bzip, um, or I think those are the main ones that you might see out there, main algorithms for compressing. Tar then indicates that the directory GHCND all, which has 122,000 some files in it, that directory was tarred together. It, everything was kind of archived together, uh, lumped together, and then the GC means that that archive, that composite entity, was then compressed. In the last episode, I was able to extract these three files to give us some data to play around with. And so we're going to keep playing with these files um, because they give us something, um, you know, it's small and uh, things don't take too long to work with. So to create an archive, I can use archive write files. And to that, I can then give the name of the archive I want to create, right? And so I'll call this write files.tar.gz, and then I have to give it the files that I want to compress, right? And so I'll come down here, and I will do um, rerun this ls, and I'll go ahead and give the star at the end of that ls, because that will give me the full path to those files. So I'll go ahead and highlight that, copy it, and then paste it up here, and I can assign this to a vector. Right, and then each of these needs to be a character type, so I need to wrap them in quotes. Um, and we'll go ahead and put those in quotes. And the same one on this third one, right? And so now what we've got is we have our C vector of the different files. So before I fire up R, I need to make sure I'm in the right conda environment. So I can do conda activate drought this will make sure that I've got everything nice and loaded. Um, I can then do R to get into my Conda environment. I will then go ahead and load these two libraries. Those load well. So I need to add a closing parentheses here, and then I can run 
um, archive write files. And if we go ahead and open up a bash script, um, let me get some more real estate here. I can then do ls, and I now see that I've got write files.tar.gz. And as we saw in the last episode, I can go ahead and do tar xvzf write files tar.gz to extract that. I now see that that basically recreated um, those three files and it put them into data, GHC and D all and, and whatnot, right? So basically it re-extracted everything back to where I just put it. Okay, so that's archive write files. There's also an archive write dir. And so that would actually be a little bit easier than what we did here. So what I could do is archive write dir. I'll call this archive write dir.tar.gz. And then I can give it the name of a directory, right? And so I can then do data forward slash ghcnd all. And so it'll use the contents of that directory to then create a, this write dir tar gz. So now again, if I come back and do ls, I now see that I've got write dir tar gz. That is great. Um, and maybe I'll go ahead and extract this one and I'll go ahead and do tar xvzf and the write uh, dir. I'll do hyphen uh, capital C practice. Oh, and I need to make a new directory. Uh, mkdir practice. Uh, I'm writing it to practice, so I'm not rewriting over everything that's already in that data ghcnd all file. So now if I look in practice, I see I've got those three files. The other thing you'll notice, the difference between archive write dir and archive write files, is that with archive write files, it preserved the path to um, those files, right? It, it, as you saw with the output, it saved data ghcnd all and then the name of the files. Whereas with archive write dir, it lost all that path, right? And so it put it here in the practice directory. Very cool. All right, so that is how you can create an archive. And if you look at the help documentation, there's a variety of ways that you can compress and collect together all those data. You can make zip files if that's what you wanna do. Um, but the, again, the key point about what we're using here is, I think, is encompassed in this tar idea, where we've got a whole bunch of files that we're putting together in an archive, and then we're compressing it. Uh, if you had a standard file that was gzipped, then that would be a single file that's compressed. Here, we're really compressing a whole bunch of files together. And so with things like read TSV or read FWF, which we've seen before, uh, you can give that a gz file, but it has to represent a single file. It can't represent a bunch of files compressed together, okay? So that's a subtle distinction that I think is pretty important. So now we wanna talk about, well, how can we see the contents of a directory, right? And so to do that, uh, let's make sure we're in R, we can then do archive, and we can then give it the name of the archive. So let's give it the one we just made, which would be write dir.tar.gz. And so then this outputs a data frame that's got the path to the file, the size, and the date that it was made, right? And so again, that's the one we just made. We could also do archive, and we could give it data forward slash uh, ghcnd all .tar .gz. This is the whole uh, data frame. So that took a few moments to run. Again, it had to kind of parse through 122,012 rows, um, and it then outputs the paths of the different files that were in this archive. One thing that's a little bit odd is that there's an empty uh, directory path here. Um, I'm not sure why that happens, but that's basically the directory name is somehow getting included in the archive. That wasn't something I could control. That's again, the way we got the data from Noah. But again, we have a tibble now that has all the names of the files that are in our archive. That is basically the same thing. Uh, if we look at data, ghcnd, all, um, files.txt, um, that's basically what's in this file, right? So if I do a head on that, I see the names of all of the different files that are in this archive, right? So again, archive and tar tvf basically do the same thing. Okay, so we've talked about how to create a compressed archive, how to look at what's in a compressed archive. How do we now read out of a compressed archive? So to read, we can do archive read, right? And so archive read will create a connection to a archive, right? And so we can then give that 
write, uh, let's do write dir.tar.gz. Running that. This then, as I said, it creates a connection. And so one thing to note is that again, uh, we know that this has three files in it. Um, and again, the full one that I just showed you earlier with this archive had 122 of them, right? But we need to give it which file we want to read out. So I could do one, that then will build the connection to that first file. And so this isn't super interesting on its own, but we can then feed this into one of the read functions, right? So we could do like read underscore TSV on that. And so again, what we're doing instead of giving it a path to a file is giving it a connection to a file within an archive. So running that, um, we get a bunch of warning messages, but you'll see that we've read in the contents of that first file um, trying to use the TSV. And we talked about in the last episode where we talked about fixed width files, why this doesn't work. But again, um, this allows us to read in um, a file from um, a targz file, which is pretty cool. And so if I want the next file, I could do two, and then it gets the next one, right? If instead of putting in the numbers, I want to put in the name of the file, well, I can grab that easily enough. And what we know is that the first, I think, 11 characters contain the name of the file, right? And so what I could put in here then would be uh, the name of the station.dly. This then does the same thing as we saw with the two. So we can give it either the name of the file we want out of that directory or the number of the file we want out, right? Uh, the other thing to note is that it's actually the, the path to that file we want, right? So again, if I look at um, archive on write dirt, um, TG, tar gz, I'm looking at these names, right? Um, and so that 6.6 six is the second one. If I wanted the third one, I'd grab that name. And that, of course, has to be in quotes. And that then reads in the third file. And so you can perhaps quickly see uh, that if I wanted to read in these three files, I could do something like this, right? I could, um, you know, I have these three read TSV functions, and I'm extracting out each of the three files, right? And so we can think about using that archive function to get the names of the DLY files that I want. So let's see how we might do this in a more generalized format, because I don't want to write out the same function 122,000 times, right? So I can take that archive statement. And again, just to remind us, we get the path, right? And so I could do uh, select on path. And let's indent that. So instead of select, so I get a vector, let's go ahead and do pull, right? And that then gives us those three names. So I can then take that vector and pipe it to map DFR. And I'll use a period as a placeholder for the contents of the data coming through. And then in here, I'll go ahead and do a tilde. That's again, the formula notation where I'm going to take that argument from that first slot, which is called X, and I'm gonna do something with it, right? And so what I can then do would be like read underscore TSV, again, parentheses, and I will then take this archive read and plop that in the middle here. And I still want that right dir tar gz, but in this position, what I'm gonna want is the dot x. Again, the value of the vector is the dot x. So now I can run this whole thing that then creates a composite data frame. Again, things are formatted poorly, but you kind of get the idea of what we can think about doing for reading in the full archive with 122,000 rows. So let's head over to our read DLY files and let's see if we can apply what we've learned to this, right? So I'll go ahead and copy this bit of code at the end of my practice and I'll put it up here right before the DLY files. So the DLY files I generated by reading in those three files from data GHC and DL. This was the approach we would have used if we could have decompressed the entire archive. So I'll go ahead and remove that. And instead, we're gonna grab this bit of code where we use the archive function, but I'm not gonna use it on write dir tar gz, right? Instead, I'm gonna do data forward slash ghcnd all dot tar gz, and then we'll pipe that uh, to pull path, and we'll see what this looks like. We might need to do a little bit of tweaking. So that should generate the vector. I'll go ahead and do head on dly files, 
and I then see all of my file names with that ghcmd all directory. I also see what I saw before when I ran archive, which was the directory name without a DLY file. So I'm gonna add a filter statement to use str detect from the stringer package, where I'll look through the path column and see if there's anything that ends in DLY, or it contains DLY, I should say, that will get rid of this ghcmd all. We'll run this and we'll then double check again to make sure we got rid of that line. Again, if I do head DLY files, I've gotten rid of that line that just had the directory name and we're in good shape. We now have our DLY files and we're now ready to think about using map DFR, right? So again, we'll do DLY files, pipe that to map DFR, and we're gonna use the contents coming through the pipeline and we're gonna then pipe that to, uh, all these pop-ups kind of get annoying with Visual Studio Code. So uh, things are just a little too sensitive. So sorry for all the pop-ups, it annoys me too. All right, so uh, we're going to again, use map DFR with the contents of DLY files piped into there. So I need to put a tilde in front of the read FWF and instead of DLY files, I'm gonna do archive read and then the archive read um, the archive that we're going to read is data forward slash ghcnd all dot tar dot gz, right? And then the, what I want is the value of dot x, right? That is the file that we're going to extract. And then we will go ahead and read it in through all this other great stuff. Um, and I think I need another parenthesis here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and only run the part where I'm reading in the archive. So before I run this full pipeline, I would rather deal on a smaller scale than all 122,000 files. So I think I'll come back up to DLY files. And on this, I'm gonna do a slice sample uh, and I'll do N equals five. And what that'll do is randomly grab five lines out of uh, this data frame. So I'll go ahead and run both of these steps to make sure it works and see how long it takes to run. And it's complaining that object widths not found and that's because I forgot to load all this other great stuff that I already had in here. So let me go ahead and make sure that I've got all these libraries loaded and get the quadruple and the widths and the headers. Okay, so that's all loaded. Now we can run this pipeline where we read in the fixed width format on those five files. So that took a little bit longer than I was really hoping it would take to process only five of the different files. Um, let's come back to the time. I wanna double check that I'm getting out what I expect to get out. And so I forgot to save this to a variable. So I'll go ahead and call this composite uh, dot last dot value. Uh, dot last dot value stores the value of the last output, right? So if I look at composite, um, I can see basically what we just had, right? So I can go ahead and do count on composite uh, and then do a search on ID. Uh, I think ID was the name of the first column, but it's all caps, so ID. And so then I see those five files and the number of rows in each of those five different data frames. Wonderful, okay. So I'm going to actually up this and that took a little bit of time to run for five. So I think what I'll do is let's go ahead and do 12. <laughs> and so we'll see how long it takes to do 12. And then we can multiply that by about 10,000 to see how long it would take. And so to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and do sys.time and at the beginning of running the pipe, as well as down here, sys.time. And then we can calculate the difference between those two different sys time values to see how long it takes and multiply the result by 10,000. And we'll see how long that takes. So it ended at 1442.20 and started at 1439.52. And so um, that is about two and a half say three minutes. So if I do 2.5 times 10,000, that's 25,000 minutes divided by 60 minutes per hour divided by 24 hours per day. It's gonna take 17 days. <laughs> that's a long time. <laughs> so one thing that we could do would be to use the, the fur package, which allows you to parallelize map functions, right? So with the GitHub Actions resources that they give you, you get three um, processors. And so this would divide that in three. So instead of being 17 days, it would be like, I don't know, 
six days, <laughs> right? So I was hoping to update this every day, not every week um, or every couple of weeks, right? And so that just doesn't seem really practical. So while I think archive read and the archive package are really useful for perhaps smaller numbers of files that I'm trying to extract from the archive, ultimately, I don't think this solution is gonna work. And so I need to go back to the drawing board in thinking about how I can get the data out of this archive that I wanna get out of it, while again, working within the constraints that are being imposed upon me by using GitHub Actions. You could say, well, why don't you go use Amazon Web Services or some other platform? Um, so why? Well, first of all, um, I wanna learn GitHub Actions, right? So there's that. Uh, the other thing is that I think GitHub Actions is gonna make things just a lot easier for me than having to kind of spin up my own website on Amazon or go into Amazon and create all sorts of um, overhead that GitHub Actions is theoretically going to do for me. So in the next couple of episodes, hopefully I'll be able to share with you the solution uh, that I have come up with to dealing with this issue. I have some ideas, but I'm not quite ready to share them with you. So that you don't miss that episode, please be sure that you subscribe down below, give this video a thumbs up, and tell all your friends what we're doing here. So practice with this, see if you can use archive read and archive write functions with your own data. Let me know how it goes, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.